I wanted to give you a very warm welcome to this session for prospective students on from our master program in humanitarian action and peace building. As I was saying, my name is Alexander Severino. I'm representing UNITAR. I have the coordination functions in this program, and I'm delighted to be here um, to welcome you and to welcome our guests today. Uh, there are some preliminary remarks I would like to, to, to make. Firstly, is to ask people who are not speaking at the moment to uh, mute their mics, please. And also to say that this session is being recorded or if there are some issues with the fact that it's being recorded and you'd not like to see your contribution uh, in the video, please contact us and we'll be sure to remove it. This said, let's move on. Um, firstly, I'll, I would like to welcome my colleague from uh, Oxford Books and Unitar, uh, Dr. Brigitte Picard, Dr. John and John and Scotzer, and also our uh, um, invited guest, Dr. Uh, Hugh Gunderson, and our our student, Mr. Seyo, that will be joining us to share with you some of his experience with us. Um, to better introduce you to, to our organizations, I will then pass the word uh, firstly to my colleague Bridget, uh, Dr. Brigitte Picard, and I take the chance to ask to, to my colleagues and, and our guests if it's okay if we move along with first names, since we are um, current friends and will be among future friends, I hope. Is this okay? Um, can we go ahead with first names, everybody? Okay, so. In this case, Brigitte, uh, the floor is yours. Brigitte? I think she needs to unmute herself. Brigitte, could you please unmute? Yeah, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect, Brigitte. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, so I was just saying thank you, Alex, and to welcome to all. And I think we will start by presenting yourself and saying maybe a few words about the institution we are representing. So my name is uh, Brigitte Picard. I'm an anthropologist by training. And I've been working for 15 years now at Oxford Brookes University on, in the field of humanitarian action and peace building, and um, uh, partly in the field and partly in Oxford, though I'm physically in Paris right now. Um, I'm working in a research center called the CENDEP, the Center for Development and Emergency Practice, which is hosting this master degree. And you may be surprised to read that it's hosted by a school of architecture. And this is hosted by a school of architecture because it was created in 1985, so quite a long time ago now, by a team of architects who wanted to rethink a reconstruction after disaster. But then it moved on to a multidisciplinary center. And today we are a team of eight workers, academic professionals, uh, practitioners, and we have developed training and research, usually very practice-based training and practice-based research on different topics like disaster risk reduction, uh, urban resilience, a lot on post migration and obviously on My, transformation uh, and, and that's a good bit something good to And uh, John Hans, do you want to say a word on UNITA? Thank you so much, Brigitte. Um, so myself, um, I've been now almost 20 years in um, working within the field of uh, education, training and development within the um, nexus of development and peace and development and i just want to say thank you so much for taking the afternoon and joining us and together with my colleagues um caroline brigitte nikolai and alex we will hope to um to allow you to walk away from this um session with something really important and that is um for those of you that are wanting to look at uh, really a valuable um, area of study, but not just in terms of the study, but those 
really important skill sets that are so relevant in this um, reality that we are living now, um, we would hope to unpack that. At the same time, I would kindly invite you, as the different speakers will um, um, unpack for you um, what we've prepared, feel free to pop your questions into the chat box. And then what we will do is, um, as we go along, we'll try to answer that for you. So thank you very much. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Jokonans and Brigitte, for the introductions to both our institutions. I'm now pleased to, 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 to move on. So, so my colleagues, Brigitte and Jokonans, can also uh, give us a very short summary of the, the added value that delivering this partnership brings, how these uh, experiences they so well mentioned, and the context that Brigitte proposed um, join to bring you an excellent program as, as, as our master is. Yes, should I start, John Hans, uh, maybe saying a couple of words on how we came up with the idea of this master degree and how we started the collaboration between UNITAR and Oxford Brookes University. Uh, the two institutions actually have a lot of common grounds and this is how the partnership started. First of all, we are both organizations who have a long history of training and education, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Um, and also the other thing is that we are both organizations working in the field. I mean, I'm, because I'm locked out in Europe right now, otherwise I would probably run this seminar from somewhere in Africa or somewhere in the Middle East right now. But, uh, so all our colleagues, whether they, they are from Oxford or they are associate lecturers in this program are field workers and academic. And this is something that we both organizations have in common. Also, we have developed this, we, we were willing to give the programs who were really responding to the needs of practitioners and to the actual needs of practitioners. So we are reviewing the program and we are trying to, to update it and to bring really all the current issue in the program all the time. So it's not a set program that exists for years and that we are just re-delivering re every year. We are really reshaping according to, to the time and the, the, the needs of the field at the very moment. Uh, we have strong networks and this is through our networks that we are working a lot. And uh, obviously, John Hans can say a few words on the UNITAR network. And at Brooks, we have over the last 35 years, a huge network of alumni associated. And those people, we are trying to bring them as much as we can in the program as well. John Hans, do you want to add something? I, I, if you would allow me, please, um, Ladies and gentlemen, those of you that's connected, Birigi talks about the strength of our network and partnerships. But allow me to extend that to you, because as Brigitte was saying, um, if she was not in lockdown um, in Paris, she would most probably be in Africa and she would be working with the brothers and the sisters of the African soil. And that is why I'm, I'm saying you are also part of that um, network of that uh, partnership that we're trying to establish because there are still so much of the cultural practices, of the know-how um, that, that is available in Africa and that we can also, through this community practice, community um, the, 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 the importance of the elder, just another example. When we look at peace building and uh, moving from uh, conflict to a culture of peace and how that is then underpinned by the theory. And it is that collaborative partnership between academic institutions and communities, how we would hope to add value to this area of collaboration and this area of study because those lived experiences are so important and it is really that partnership that blend of working with 
individuals, yourself, that are at the forefront, that's members of these communities, and that how we share our experiences in um, building this program and the shared experiences in the actual study and um, challenging. And we very often say, um, you know, the aspect of critical thinking, analysis, evaluation, and synthesis is really important um, element. In this program, we'll actually see how it becomes when we look at the theory versus practice and we use these higher order level and thinking skills, that rich, rewarding experience. And it's about those practical recommendations that uh, comes out at the end. And it's about that partnership. Back to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Brigitte and John. And I think this was a, an overview of rich value of cooperating and what we can bring concretely, being the two of us together uh, in this uh, journey. Uh, before I move on to, to, to invite our guests, which I'm really looking forward to, I just want to say hi to our colleague, Caroline Tyndale. I've noticed she joined us. Hello, Caroline. It's good to have you here. Hi, um, thank you very much. Um, so we move along, and I'm pleased to introduce um, Dr. Du Gunderson. I think it's okay, as you mentioned, that, Nikolai, that we move along with first names. She's a well-known political commentator, and author of the interesting work, The Privatization of Warfare. Uh, uh, apart from being here as invited expert, Nicola is one of my, uh, one of my most recent colleagues for, for the program. He will be facilitating uh, uh, part of the course of, on post-stabilization, and I'm delighted to, to, we are delighted to have him here. Nicola, would you be so kind to share with us some words about you or your work? Absolutely, and thank you very much for such a warm uh, welcome and hello to all of you who've uh, tuned in today. Um, as was mentioned earlier by one of my colleagues, we have a focus on theory and practice, and I think that this is something that I really took to heart uh, so far in my career. I've lived in the Middle East, uh, Turkey, Jordan, Kuwait, I speak Arabic, and I try to focus on field experience and also um, trying to humanize the cultures that I've visited. So understanding politics from a human perspective, uh, this is a very important aspect of, I think, not just post-conflict reconstruction, but international relations in general to humanize other cultures and to celebrate differences. And this is what I try to bring to my work that, you know, the, the Middle East, um, Europe, wherever we study, these areas are very, very nuanced. It's not black and white. And so I think that through field experience, you recognize that. Thank you so much, Nikolai. That's why we're so happy to have you too. Thank you. Um, and before we move on to the deba debate, um, I also, I'm also very pleased to introduce you one of our most devoted students, which I really uh, am proud to have encountered through, through our master program, Mr. Sayo, with, that apart from being, again, one of our most devoted students, is also a skilled planning, monitoring, and evaluation, reporting, and learning specialist. Mimi, welcome, and would you also be so kind to share some words about your work with us? Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm Bimi Moses Sewa, I'm from Sierra Leone, and I've been working in international development for the last 10 years. I've worked in Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, and I'm currently based in working in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, for the past 10 years, I've been working with the UN in emergencies and development programs and uh, it's focus on monitoring and evaluation of development interventions. And I'm a student of Southbrook's University. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Bimi. Um, so just br a brief word to tell you how we thought about moving along with our webinar. And the idea was, our, was for us to have a general discussion with our guests, in which you are most than welcome to contribute through the chat. I'll ask the cooperation of my colleague John Hans to to bring on some questions because I don't have because of um, share screening options uh, the possibility of checking the, the the chat. So I'll ask your collaboration, John Hans, if some questions arise. And our idea would be indeed to move on to 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 discuss some topics we thought would be interesting to bring to light uh, in always in reference to education and to the work that we are doing here. 
so initially, I was thinking about the key trends identified in the fields of peace, security, and development for the period of 2020 to 2030. And we see referred natural disasters driven by climate change, uh, famine and food insecurity also caused by climate change again, and then large scale displacement uh, caused by interstate conflict and, in, uh, and also climate change, if we, if, if we really think about it. And I was wondering, and I start with, with you, Nikolai, how do you think, how can transversal strategies tackle these realities we are facing and will face in the future? Are these common, common strategies that are to be defined in general, or do you think this can be or should be adapted to specific scenarios? Are there, are there transversal strategies that we can already outline? Uh, I, I would be happy yes. to invite you to jump in on the topic. Well, I think uh, climate change, you know, as, as one topic, one of the issues we have here is how do we get people involved? Um, and I think that one of the issues is getting every single person to care because we all can contribute in some way. And this is a problem also, it's a socioeconomic problem in the sense that it's very hard to tell people who rely on their cars and rely on what not to, to cut back. At the same time, we have now a current disaster, the coronavirus, which has locked us all up in our homes. And in a sense of irony, we're now seeing that uh, pollution levels have dropped, you know, and I think that that, if anything, is a, is a reminder of the fact that we all share this planet and that collective action can be positive and can contribute. So I think that really for climate change and other uh, scenarios or other aspects, we have to we have to bear in mind that we can all contribute in some way. And I think this is something we should, we should teach to ensure that people do take it up as, as a personal task and say that as an individual, you know, I am a drop in this ocean. Um, people who read out climate change or who, who you know, are, are involved in it will have their own specialization. We then need to be able to get people outside of that to be able to say, well, I can also get involved. And if you think more about the organizational level and, and, and the strategies devised within organizations, international organizations, to tackle these issues, my question would be, would, what do you think can be these transversal strategies? Because we are talking here about different things, natural disasters on one hand, displacement on the other, okay? So, yes. so famine on, on, other, on other angle if we want. So are there a common, uh, there, is there a common ground in terms of a strategy, comprehensive, transversal, that we, that we can look at to well, offer I think, so effective solutions? Yes. Well, here I think it will vary from case to case also because uh, a lot of people would assume that it's a top-down process and we do need international organizations to be involved, but we also need to ensure that when we engage with local organizations and communities, we address their needs and their concerns. And this is part of the issue as well. I think that firstly, as I said before, building trust and understanding, mutual understanding, because if you wanna talk about climate change and its you know, effect on the planet, that's all good and well, but local communities may say that we have more immediate concerns. So how can we, is there a middle ground? We both need to ensure that we have mutual understanding. And I think that, you know, from my time in the Middle East, we, we've seen this, uh, from some NGOs that have tried to start a project with their own goals in mind, but they haven't necessarily coordinated with people on the ground so that everyone's on the same page. I think that's a huge part of it. So mutual understanding and localization, understanding local problems, and also um, communicating with the local community to show how they can be a part of the solution as well. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Any 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 input you have on your side, Bimi, or or examples you've seen on the ground of how these transversal strategies were potentially applied and developed, or even designed at an earlier stage? Any comments? Uh, well, I mean, in in general, I recall when I was actually working for an NGO in Jordan, uh, we found uh, that we were approached by a UK. NGO who wanted to start a project in Jordan and they used us as a go-between precisely for that reason where they said you know we're new to to the environment in Jordan so we would like to actually partner with a local NGO 
who has, um, we had grassroots campaigns and we knew people and we knew local communities. I think that was a, a very good example for us of partnering with an international UK based organization so that uh, we were able to help each other and they could through us address local needs on the ground. Thank you. This is a very interesting example. I, I was also looking forward to, to hear some input from, from Bimi. Uh, Bimi, do you have any example you could share or any general ideas about what these transversal strategies could be for the present and the future? Yeah, definitely. I will start my conversation using the approach that's uh, using the, the, the going with the ability of, of saying that uh, all size doesn't fit or one size doesn't fit all in terms of international development and um, country context should be taken into account when designing and implementing projects especially in developing countries um, having worked in Sierra Leone during the post-conflict phase and uh, working worked in Afghanistan during the conflict phase and now currently working in DRC these are three different countries that have different development needs however the approach of using one context to apply to the other context has never worked in my case so basically, I will always advise development planners and practitioners to have a better understanding of country context, have a better understanding of stakeholders' perspectives, have a better understanding of the real needs of the people. And development should not be development for ourselves. Those who are involved, who the development is for or is being designed for should be in the process should be part of the, de the design process, should be part of the design process, should be part of the implementation. Apparently, they should be involved in every cycle, in every phase of the project cycle. Thank you so if much. Not, uh, at the end of the day, they'll think you are, if not the, at the end of the day, they'll think you are imposing uh, your own Western ideology or your own ideology on them, which most cases they can resist in terms of accepting your needs and the development you are bringing to them. Thank you so much, Bimi. I, I really like the points you referred, Nikolai, of the top-down approach and how it sometimes, you know, seen as the only solution. And Bimi, ref, uh, re, um, highlighting the, the, the difficulties with one-size-fits-all approaches. And this makes me <laughs> uh, bring my colleague John Hans into the discussion because it's one of his areas of, of, of study and research too, this, the, the, the issue of the Western paradigm and how it can influence strategies when then they could be in turn more transversal, more approachable if there was other level of involvement. Any remarks, John Hans? Again, I can just say it's, it I, I couldn't agree with um, with him more. It's it's about how you you identify and you build partnerships, but partnerships for delivery, real tangible delivery outcomes that is important about the individuals. And we have to be so careful very often in the development or the humanitarian language where we talk about victims and the most deprived and the most vulnerable and we ourselves in that language and this sort of lexicon of language that we actually take people's dignity away and to remind and i think our colleague was was very elegant and what he was trying to say is you know the one of the first priorities when you work with members of the communities who find themselves in adverse conditions let's remember they are very dignified human beings and the one thing where we start is to um, work with them with that dignity that they deserve thank you thank you Tranans. brigitte from your experience so vast experience in the field if you had to say that and you know a rough evaluation that what is your impression of one size fits all approaches are there still common unfortunately and do you think there should be more room for transversal strategies actually this is interesting because we didn't uh, consult each other and we all came with this first 
the localization as the, the first or the most important strategy. And indeed, um, I would go maybe even a bit further than John Hansen Bimi by saying it's not only the needs, but this is also the strengths of the community we have to bring in the program. I mean, it's, uh, it would be a mistake to believe that communities are only victims, but it would be also a, a mistake not to see them as social actors and very active actors for their own relief and their own, own uh, development. And therefore, it's very important, I think, to bring the strengths, the capacities, the knowledge in what we do. So it's not only bringing all program based on the needs, it's really building on the initiatives and building on the capacities, building on the strengths in order to, to make a very sustainable, uh, I mean, to find sustainable solution. Thank you so much, Brigitte. It's just, and you, you just highlighted our focus when we, we, and Bimi can confirm when we have our modules on com community-based approaches and the concern we have in the program to, 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 to take that into account. Before moving to, uh, to the other point of discussion, I wanted to ask if Nikolai and Bimi would like to add anything to, to this one. Um, well, if I may, I think just as has just been mentioned, localization is very important. I think dignity is very important. So um, when we work with various actors and people on the ground, whether they're refugees or others, even if they've been through war, and go through difficult times, it's important to acknowledge what they've been through without demeaning them. And I say this because I know, again, from my time in the Middle East, there are some actors who have wanted to help, but because they have done so without seeing those who they wish to help as, as equal, i.e. they've seen them as victims, they have not offered to help in a localized manner. And I, I think we keep coming back to this, ensuring that we are able to help in an appropriate manner and that we respect how they feel and uh, value their dignity and their point of view as well. Thank you so much, Nikolai. So um, we talked about the organizational level, this, this more general global uh, transversal skills, but I'm also curious to learn your views about the individual sphere. So what would be the core skill set and, and, and um, transversal skills needed for professionals working in these areas to hopefully leverage this, this more transversal, comprehensive, open view to the organizational level. And picking up on your point, Nicolai, so I'll start with you. Well, I think, again, it all starts with, with empathy and the desire to, to humanize and to understand others. Um, I do feel that we are all products of our culture, and this is an important point because it means that we will all have certain biases that we cannot fully see until we start to challenge them. And this is what empathy does. As you go out into the field and you work with different NGOs and different people, you will start to challenge some of those biases and you will start to see things from other perspectives. That to me is really at the core of peacekeeping and diplomacy, empathy, cultural understanding. This is, this is a core skill or a soft skill, if you like, that I think that one builds on and that organizations should build on. Thank you. What about you, Bimi? Do you agree with Nikolai? Would 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 these be the first ones that come to your mind, or are there others that no, you thought? Of no, def definitely working in the field and working with committees yeah. in terms of providing development aid and uh, interventions to them. One thing you have to have in mind is, um, and always have in your plan of work is, one you have to understand that even in poverty there is dignity and uh, you taking aid or development interventions to communities you have to really understand the cultural context or the cultural beliefs of the communities you are intending to work with and uh, in the time of understanding or in the act of you respecting cultures you've been working with or you'll be working with it's also difficult you can it's i know it's difficult mostly it has happened to me on several occasions but you have to resist in terms of responding to culture shocks because that gives them a diff that it gives the beneficiaries or communities you are working with a different perspectives in terms of whether they should actually open up to you in terms of respecting in, in terms of opening up to you in terms of allowing you to really interact with them very well because in countries I've worked in culture, 
to me to them means absolutely everything thank you so much for bringing the light on on empathy that's definitely needed in the world we live in and always uh Bridget, would you would you share also some some input from from your experience and uh, what do you think is the role of again empathy? Do you see it also as it comes to our, to your mind immediately? Is are there other core uh, skill set and transversal uh, competencies that um, and transversal skills? I'm sorry, at the individual sphere that you think are important? Yes. Um... Well, the first thing that came in my mind was definitely all the soft skills, whether it's uh, empathy, whether it's the way we communicate, the way we are able to uh, to relate to people, to to manage stress when we work in very stressful environment, the way we manage our team. Uh, and often uh, we think about competencies in terms of technical skills. And I'm quite happy to see that the first thing that came again in the conversation were much more soft skills. And I think that's really the most important is who we are. I, is probably uh, as important as what technically we are able to do. And I would add something that, I mean, obviously I fully agree with all what have been said, but. I think that our critical understanding is also something extremely important. Uh, the ability we have to try to understand and to make sense of what we see or what we we will have to to deal with whenever we we are working. I mean, it's not because it's an emergency or because it's a very adverse environment that we do not have to take the time to try to understand all the different perspectives and all the different layers and all the different uh, uh, factors that are really affecting the situation we are dealing with. That again brings us probably to empathy, indirectly, having empathy not only with the people but also with the situation we are dealing with, with our judgment but really trying to understand. And if we can really merge all those soft skills plus a real critical understanding, I think we can be very, very well equipped for dealing in the context we are we, we are really covering. Thank you so much, Brigitte. Uh, Jonathan, I don't know how the question session is going, but I have I seen a notification about a hand raise for from Ramesh. So before moving on to, to you, Jonathan, uh, Ramesh, would I, I hope I'm pronouncing it well. Uh, yeah, yeah, would yeah. you like to pose your question? Yeah, actually, and uh, just once, uh, just uh, I would like to, to ask you to refer to the speaker you want to, to to address. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Actually, I have a concern regarding skill and abilities. If we are talking about the soft skills, can we add something related to communication skill? What type of communication skill is required? Basically, my focus is only on communication skill or communication strategy regarding the development of this particular program. Just I want to know. Because communication is an integral part of soft skill. Yeah, please. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, uh, you have. We understand. We understand. Uh, you, you, your question is more related to communication and and yeah, and yeah, yeah. Communication skills and strategies. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying that since you did not identify a concrete speaker, if you agree, I'll deliver this question to my colleague John Hans. Okay. Jonathan, you're mute. You're mute. Uh, Ramesh, thank you very much. Can I just ask you to mute your microphone, Ramesh? Otherwise, we will have an echo on this system. And I will try to very briefly answer your question. Brilliant question. Okay, okay, allow me to say when we... So what I would like you to do is to think in terms of... So you take your communication lens... And I would like you to look at issues such as 
complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, um, coordinating um, uh, people, um, information, judgment and decision making, all of these things, the cement that you need to keep it all together is communication. So it's an integral part of all of this. And this is why I was saying to you that within this master, the communication is indeed one of those soft um, skills that is indeed integrated. But what we don't do is necessarily from a journalistic or from a subject specialization, you know, separate communication or public relations or media studies, no the fundamental importance of communication is absolutely embedded in it because how do you translate cultural practices how do you relate to people that are fundamentally different how do you how do you engage with opposing sides to a conflict that is the power of the communication skill sets and what i would like to do is maybe throw um, this now to Nicola because he um, he has a very interesting experience when he decided to build his own capacities he went to the Middle East and I would like to ask him how did he build then his own communication capacity and expertise and able to translate all these um, complexities that he was working with oh, thank you very much for that um... It's funny we're talking about communication because, as some of you know, I learned Arabic and I am now learning Turkish. And I have to say, it's not the easiest language to learn. I assumed after Arabic it would be, and I was wrong. Um, but yet, yeah, returning to the point, you see, there's different layers of communication. And I think that one of the things that's important in international relations is as you gain field experience, you will build uh, understanding from different cultures and you will also build on cultural specific empathy and cultural specific communication. So I during my time in the Middle East, the first year, I did not speak Arabic, but I began to, to get to know the culture anyway. Uh, eventually, I did start to learn the language, and I found that this allowed me to also identify cultural similarities across different Arab countries. And that means that although my expertise, if you like, or my field experience is more built on Jordan, it uh, became an investment that allowed me to communicate further in other Arab cultures, um, because there are these similarities. So I think that for myself, being able to, to understand the language was a big help, but also there are different modes of communication. Uh, there are different ways to make people open up and feel welcome. And if you show that you understand their culture, this is a big help. Uh, we now have, for example, uh, Ramadan is starting, which is quite a, a spiritual time for many people across the Arab world and the Muslim world. I recall that uh, when I was actually running a conference on the Middle East to make some of the Arab students feel more uh, welcome, I served sweets and coffee specific to their cultures and i knew where to get it even though i'm in london so the point i'm making here is communication is multi-layered and so are we we as individuals are, are multi-layered and we will go through different stages of understanding other cultures so communication isn't just about learning the language but also uh, learning about the cultures in question so that you can then have some common ground and also show especially when you work in vulnerable communities show that you are making an effort to understand them Thank you so much, Nikolai. Also, education should be multi-layered to be able to tackle precisely what you highlight. Um, I had a couple of more discussion points, but I hope we can continue in the discussion phase so we can make sure that we can present our program concretely to you as well. So we need to move on at, at, at this point, and I hope that Nikolai and Bimi uh, actively engage on the, answering the questions and, and continuing to foster the debate. So to introduce the, the to introduce the key features of the program, I'll pass down the word again to my colleague Bridget. Yes. So the before that on the slide before uh, we had um, maybe the, the content as well of the, the the master. The master is a master in humanitarian action and peace building. I mean, as we said at the very beginning, that does not mean that we are 
really working on peace building in one side and on humanitarian action in the, on the other side. What we are trying to see is what is really overlapping between the two. They are usually considered a separate field and we do consider them as fields who are very closely connected interrelated and this is really this interconnection and this interrelation that we are trying to to find out and today mostly when we work in protracted conflict for example uh, we see that we have to start thinking of long-term long-term strategy whether it's um it's uh uh i mean working on resilience for example or working already on the linguist development uh, how do we work on social cohesion, whether we are doing food delivery. So everything is indirectly related to, and this is really what we are trying to, to, to tackle in this program. And this is also its uniqueness. You will find program in humanitarian action, you will find program in peace building. There, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, we are the only one really trying to merge the two and to deal with the two in the same time. So in the next slide, Thank you. So, and, and here I will invite my colleague John Hans to, to, to join me for explaining some of the key features of, the, of this program. We are a strictly online program. That's a choice we made to make sure that we will be able to bring people from the field without having to ask you to take one year off or maybe more than one year off to come to England or to another places to, and to be away from your field, away from your work, away from your family. We want you to be able to continue to work and the program has been developed for people even working full time and in order for you to be able to, to study and to work in the same time. And this is quite important because we are really, to try, we are really trying to bring your work practice in the program. We are really trying to ask you to build on your work experience almost on a daily basis. What we discuss in a, in a discussion forum, try to apply it the day after in the field and come back with your comments. I mean, uh, this happened a couple of times, for example, with students working in, in refugee camps. And we were discussing an issue in the evening and the day after they say, well, I was in my refugee camps and I discussed this and that. And I still agree with part of the discussion, but I have to bring more comments about another part of the, uh, of the discussion. And this is really the wealth of the, of the program is that people keep applying what we are doing in the program in the field practice and they can fit the program with the result of uh, the field practice. So, as we have said already, it's a program which really also uh, uh, developed on your needs. We will start knowing you, knowing what is your interest, and according to your interest, we will try to bring them also in the program. That we, uh, requests a lot of creativity, flexibility, but this is what online program is also about, and this is what we can do quite, quite easily. And uh, it's quite likely that the COVID-19 issue will be probably part of the program next year or maybe already in, in, the, in the, the module we have started this week because this is part of what most of our students are living. And so it's quite interesting that we can bring it in what we are, we are studying. We have started, for example, the, the module on culture sensitivity and how do we relate culture and a pandemic like the one we are living and how it impacts culture is probably one of the topics we will be, we'll be developing in the program. What obviously we were not thinking about two or three months ago, uh, but this is really what students are living currently, so it's quite interesting to be able to reflect on it. It's facilitated, facilitated by a huge team, I think we have more than 20 lecturers on this program, all academic and practitioner, and this is also part of, of of the specificity of this program is that we can relate to theory and to to academic background but also we would share our daily practice in the field and of course where sometimes theories does not totally fit the reality of the of the practice or how practice sometimes can be more complex than what we believe and all of this is what we are we really uh, discussing and using as the key feature of the program John Hans, do you want to add something? Brilliantly said. There's absolutely nothing I can contribute. Thank, Thank you so much. 
So we, you, uh, Brigitte, uh, if you could provide us just on a theoretical basis, a paragraph to summarize why we chose these approaches and these authors to guide our theoretical um, ground, let's say, and, and when compared to others and why, why is this the approach we, we selected? Well, it's probably, we have, I would say, almost said it all already on that because uh, in the conversation with yeah. the way later, uh, earlier on. Mm -hmm. Because what we are really trying to be, it's much more bottom-up pro uh, program and then really a top-down one. And somehow, so we have search and we have, I mean, th that's probably part of who we were as well. We have taken approaches who are really people-centered really cultural sensitive and really based on again understanding and trying to uh, to bring the the strengths existing in the field and how we can really use them for uh, humanitarian action and peace building and of course we are not the first one who think that way and we have already authors who have been thinking that way in conflict transformation and we are closer from conflict transformation than than really conflict resolution in this program we are using for example Lederacht and Galtung who are two authors who have been developing a lot all the issue of uh, how do we take into consideration the root cause of conflict and try to find solution to root cause to conflict. And if we talk about root cause to conflict, you see directly the link we can do with development. And uh, because obviously, um, an, an equal access to resources, for example, is usually one of the root cause of conflict. And that link us directly to the issue of humanitarian action and peace building. In humanitarian action, this is the same. We have been using act, uh, authors who are really centering their work on, on the people and on the communities. And so it's not really a meta discourse on the role of humanitarian action. It's really how do we leave our communities leave the relief efforts on a day-to-day -day basis and how do organization, whether they are national organization, local organization, faith-based organization, international organization, uh, UN agencies, how do they deliver humanitarian action? Mm -hmm. And then again, we are trying to be ex extremely people-centered and culture-sensitive. And this is why we are using, for example, Pulini, but we are using, of course, different actors, uh, authors who have decided to go on that field. Thank you so much, Brigitte. So indeed, so we depart from this theoretical basis to then fit in with the practical field experiences and your own inputs in terms of structuring, structuring our content. So now I'm happy to bring in Bimi to talk about a bit about his experience and uh, and to explore this notion we had and that was identified as the role as a student of our program. So to investigate cutting edge issues in the field. And here I get back to the points of my colleagues of, of what is out there and also for the trends I identified, propose innovative tools based on your specific research or Field experience as well, things that you have tested and you bring along for us to share with your colleagues and us and reflect on current current field practices. And this might mean that we, we develop this critical angle, which we uh, share so much in this program. Um, also to broaden perceptions, again, to, to, to open our views, to include all the elements that were referenced in the discussion in terms of soft skills and communication and, and different lenses, okay? And then develop and refine the hard and soft skills needed to work effectively. And this we, we, we developed not as much as we'd, we would like, but a lot during our discussion early on. So Bibi, my question is basically, do you feel this, you had the chance to explore this role? And uh, if you can provide us with some input and a summary of your views on our program and, and what, you, what you think, the ways in which you think um, it helped you grow as a professional. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, one of the best decisions I took was to take a master's program with Oxford Brookes University and UNITA. 
and taking into consideration the composition of uh, our lecturers with different uh, theoretical and practice based experience was so enriching within the pro program and uh, having different perspectives in terms of listening to students or having conversations with students from different parts of the world who've been in practice for over years and uh, having working in humanitarian coordination and, and uh, development practice. It was also enriching because I had joined the program from UNDP apparently Around so, eight years of work experience, but we, uh, we, coming we, to we needed to have a we, rich we lost you. Bimi, can you? Is your connection working properly? Yes, can you I'm, hear me? I'm still here. Oh, I, yes, I think I here. think we lost you for for a couple of minutes, but you're back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry. I have to go. So basically, I was just saying before I went off is that um, the composition of students in this program was also an, an enriching experience because having worked in international development and uh, mostly my my student counterparts were also living and working in countries with special development needs and mostly post-conflict and conflict countries. So hearing their perspectives of how things work. I could remember we were discussing transitional justice in one of the programs. I had different transitional justice in other countries, in other post-conflict countries, in terms of getting to con the country back on its grounds and you know, in terms of operational issues. We had transitional justice in Sierra Leone, but ours, is, well, ours approach to transitional justice was unique because we used the, tool, the dual approach. We had a tribunal and we had a truth and reconciliation commission. Colleagues in the program were really much interested to know how did Sierra Leone manage to the dual system, which has not been in most cases a transitional approach in most conflict, post conflict countries. I also learned a lot from my, my, my professors because they are not only theoretically based, like Bridget could say, they are also field based. So mixing the two approaches was also an enriching experience. And in terms of using these experiences within my current work location has been very rewarding. Like cultural sensitivity has been the most I could bank on in terms of the work I do with the UN in Congo, because I am always in communities interacting with them, helping them inform, uh, helping them, helping us in, in, um, by building up informed intervention. Sorry, it seems that we, we lost Bimi again. The connection. Bimi? Alexandra, I would suggest that. As we move on, yeah. Um, uh, Bimi, if you join uh, us at, at some point, uh, we lost you again. Um, and I, I wanted to, to thank you so much for your input and hopefully to explore it a bit further. If we have a time for questions, would I would like to guarantee, but we are a bit behind. Is this okay we go along, Bimi? Yes, very well, very well. Thank That's you so okay. much for your kind words and we definitely, we definitely learned a lot with you and all your colleagues too. This is a learning experience also for us. Now it's time to, to move on to the skills you will develop with us. And I kindly ask my colleague, Yo John Ant, which is very good with summaries and making sure to convey all the important information to guide us through the skills you will develop uh, in the master. Thank you very much, um, Alex. And yeah, again, I would ask um, Bimi, Brigitte and Nikolai, please to, to jump in and to, um, so without us, you can clearly see, because what I would much rather like is for you to focus on those and then um, for me to rather talk again about the linkages of these important skill sets when we do work in terms of um, development cooperation, humanitarian um, interventions, and the contribution that it makes towards 
um, peace building. And as um, Ramesh was saying, you know, just how important communication is in all of this, because when you do development cooperation and peace building, there is no sustainable development without peace. And there is no peace without sustainable development. When you look at the link between peace building and humanitarian aid, humanitarian aid brings the resources for peace and peace reduces the risk of future humanitarian crises. And all of these elements, ladies and gentlemen, are the tools and the skill sets that you will have to, it is a no um, uh, listed in, 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 in priority of any shape or form. But if you then look at the humanitarian aid and the development cooperation um, link, humanitarian aid creates the preconditions for development and the development builds the capacity to resist future crises. So it's, it, it's all of these skills, a combination, some of them at times where you would have to um, connect to it individually, but what is really important, and, and yes, the, the best way that I can illustrate to it is to recommend for those of you that are not familiar with the book um, that was written by Andrew Morton and Bimi would most probably know, um, and it's called, it's uh, Morton and it's called Three Cups of Tea. And it just demonstrates the importance to understand the community that you work with, because in Afghanistan, the traditional practice would be to offer you the first cup of tea, and that is you are welcome as a foreigner that's a little bit lost in the country. The second cup of tea that they will offer you, you are now becoming a friend. And the third cup of tea, you are now almost like a member of the family. And I had to learn the hard way when I was negotiating a Air India passenger plane hijacking scenario in, um, in Kandahar. And I just realized um, two days into the negotiations, um, we were just not making any headway. But then I remember when I was in the madrasas, how important these cultural practices and the cultural um, translation and how you have to understand the great opportunities that is available in the local context and given to you by the um, local community. And it's a combination of these skill sets and how you're going to involve the local community, the elders, and um, as I was explaining to you, that nexus between development, humanitarian and peace building, and how it all interconnects to make a whole and how the skills becomes the tool sets. Um, and I pass to Nicola and then um, Brigitte, if I could ask you to contribute, and then Bini. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, it's actually very interesting you mentioned the, the three cups of tea because in the Arab world there's a similar social custom. And I think this is something to remember. I actually I published an article, I think it was last year, about this the difference in custom between. For example, the West versus the Middle East, that often in the West we rush into business, we, we sign the contract. And for many people doing business for the first time in the Gulf, it's very frustrating when they think that they're going to sign the contract and they don't. And the reason for that is because often there's a lot of chit chat over coffee in this case, as opposed to tea, um, discussing, you know, how are you? How's your family? Uh, how do you find Bahrain or how do you find Iraq? And the point here is not that the, your hosts do not necessarily want your business, but the point is it's about getting to know each other, that they sincerely want to get to know you as a person. And from there, we, we build uh, a relationship and from that we build trust. So again, uh, as you get your, to familiarize yourself with these customs, there are so many opportunities that present themselves uh, to take advantage of where you are invited to sit down, you are invited to, to partake in some sort of custom that allows the building of trust. And that's something we should remember. So sometimes when you go abroad, uh, you, you sort of, you know, sit back and enjoy the ride a bit. You know, say yes to, to the invitation to someone's home, say yes to a cup of tea, because this is how you learn 
how a uh, piece is built. Any other comments from the, the, the invitees from Jonathan, Brigitte and Bimi? From my end, uh, I, I've, over the years I've learned to understand that understanding cultural context and uh, customs in international development environments helps build trust with uh, beneficiaries. Because if you tend not to understand like um, the context you are working in, it's always difficult to have a breakthrough because uh, people will feel unsafe to actually interact with you because they think you don't understand their culture or, or their customs. So that's a groundbreaking rule for understanding uh, international development, cultural sensitivity, and uh, getting your work through in a very peaceful manner. Thank you, Bimi. Any remark, Brigitte, or shall we go along? No, I think that they have said it all. I mean, I could only repeat the same things in, a, in another context, or, but, but indeed, I think that really culture, uh, culture sensitivity, understanding the way people do and building on it, it's one of the key factors in, if we want really to, to get any form of dignified and sustainable uh, response to, to crisis. Thank you, Brigitte. Any any additional points on the on the on on the program focus, Jonathan? You're mute. Thank you. Um, just to draw attention um, for um, those who've joined us. Um, so the program focus um, focuses both in terms of um, those of us that are working within conflict, um, and, and this deals with the themes of humanitarian action, protection, um, resilience, rehabilitation, reconstruction, development, governance, um, but also those of us that are working on the aspect of um, in terms of um, uh, developing strategies, um, uh, looking um, at, and, and yeah, it's again the, the example of Ramesh, where he was saying, you know, the role of communication, how can I apply, is how we look then at issues of a conflict pre prevention, um, management, mitigation, conflict transition, negotiation, building positive relations. And I just think we can use the current COVID-19 um, pandemic and that we just see in how many of these, um, we clearly see the gaps and the faults that there are in so many of these um, paradigms that we thought we got right. And that just allows us to, to, to show how um, we can contribute to strengthen these either as if we want to pursue um, in terms of really a hands-on or more in terms of um, from, from a strategic or a management perspective. And it's really that perfect balance between the two. Um, Brigitte, if, if you possibly would like to add anything. Your example of COVID-19 is, is really good, actually, because uh, it shows something that we could believe is something who have nothing really to do with peace building and humanitarian action. We could think, okay, there is a pandemic that happened and it's a health issue. But in the end, it's very important to show how much it is a development issue, a governance issue, but also what impact it will have in terms of humanitarian action and even peace building. And we see it already with our students who are again working in refugee camps, for example, in Jordan today, and uh, who are wondering how they can keep social distancing in the refugee camps and how do we protect refugees in the case of pandemic. But also we can see in 
countries, and I'm thinking of the Central African Republic, for example, today, how much people believe that it's Westerners who have brought the pandemic and how much they start scapegoating uh, expatriates. And there is a risk of conflict or risk at least of violence due to the pandemic. So issue such as working in conflict and working on conflict can be even related and studied in the context of the uh, of COVID-19 today. And I think this is a way of thinking that what we are doing not only is relevant, but linking the two issues is extremely relevant as well in what we are daily living. And uh, this is definitely affecting our daily life, all of us today. You're mute as well. Um. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was thanking you for, for the very interesting inputs and for indeed making clear that we approach both these dimensions. Um, so, so widening a bit the perspectives after, after the program and linking it back to COVID, which I think tells so much about everything. It's so important for us, all of us at the moment and, and, and Thank you for the examples, Brigitte. Indeed, one of the students I was supervising works in a refugee camp in Jordan, so it was very, you know, it was just what you described. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to then proceed so I can give you an overview of the Moodle, but I, I, I'm on, 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 on the program side. I, I wanted to ask again uh, my colleague John Anz and Brigitte if they want to wrap up by referring to, to, to these dimensions we highlighted in the, in the graph. Uh, Brigitte, um, please feel free to start. Uh, yes, John Hans, it was, uh, yes, I was waiting for you to start. I mean, I think that uh, this again said it, I mean, if we take again COVID is explaining again all, all what we have here in the circle. The fact that different sectors are very much linked in what we are doing, whether it could be health, whether it could be uh, uh, food security, but also uh, governance issue, uh, communication, as we have discussed it before. So all sectors are interlinked. And um, we are working in different stages of conflict. First, we have we are not working only in international conflict. We are working in all forms of unrest and uh, insecure environment. So that can be, again, an insecure environment that can be brought because of another, uh, another issue. I mean, the pandemic could be one. Uh, climate change can be another one. Um, economic crisis, such as in Venezuela, for example, is another one as well. So we work from pre-conflict or from escalation to post-conflict and rehabilitation. I go a bit quick because there is many, many stages. And the different uh, level of analysis as well. And this is where we are so complementary uh, because we are so multidisciplinary again. So we have people who will be, who have maybe more psychological background, uh, can really talk about individual perspective. We have people who are sociologists, anthropologists, who will work maybe more on the community per, per point of view. Then we have people who are much more coming from the field of inter international relations. Uh, we we'll talk much more on the regional and the international point of view. And of course, we can only understand conflict and response to conflict if we take all those levels. There is not one level is more important than another. We really have to understand all levels if we really want to find a good appropriate um, uh, uh, response or intervention. John Hans? Thank you so much, Brigitte. Allow me, um, please, just a couple of minutes. And, and again, I would like to say, let's focus on what we are actually living now as we all continue to live under this COVID confinement. Um, we are starting to see elements of communal violence and we just don't know what will be the outcome as long as this COVID will continue. As we speak, health workers in Mexico are being attacked. Um, asset and um, uh, are, are being thrown at them because 
the way that the narrative has been framed in Mexico is that it's the health workers who has brought the virus. Um, and so much of these skills and the focus areas that you will be learning in this program that you gain, and also through the peer learning, and that is really important, how um, through the peers, this virtual classroom experience are going to help you to try to contribute to what you are living right now, what we continue to live right now. Because I am, I'm one of those proponents that do say, when we eventually going to see the sun come up again and these dark clouds of COVID-19 is going to dissipate, I do think there's going to be a different world and a different way. Now, dramatically different, but there will be stresses and tensions even in our own societies. And we are going to see um, elements of stresses and tension in the socioeconomic, social, religious fabric of whom we all belong. And I think this is again how this program in so many of these inherent skill sets and um, study areas will help you to hopefully be able to contribute some substance and value back into your community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the overview. I think it's quite useful and clear. Um, so it's now time for me to give you a very brief overview so can leave really time for questions, which is our goal both uh, on the UNITAR and Oxford Books, Oxford Books and to, to learn more about your, your questions and, and your points of view. So without further ado, um, let me just exchange, uh, stop the sharing and again, move here. Can you all see this Moodle page? Is it visible? Okay, perfect. So once you log into Moodle, the system that we use to provide you with our program, there's this uh, a general tab, which is refers to all the elements of the master program in which you'll be able to find uh, in an organized and structured fashion, uh, all documents re relevant to, to your studies, from the student handbook to the user guide, sections on news and announcements, uh, a sharing of staff and student profiles, a social area in which we try to replicate some level of contact and interaction with you, um, as well as some uh, dedicated technical support and induction material, which hopefully will make your journey with us um, more sound and, and, and getting you know familiar with Moodle more easy. Then you'll also have up front the key readings for all the program. And then we have our own space on the lecturing team side also to organize ourselves and provide you with the best experience. Um, I wanted also to give you an example of a concrete module. Um, and this one is on uh, post-stabilization, post-conflict stabilization and recovery and all modules will um, all look more or less like this in terms of structure. And I take this chance, Brigitte, if I forget something, uh, feel free to add because I'm trying to go quickly so we have time for the questions. I might need something. So in, in all modules, you have an initial chapter on the module doc documentation. We have a welcome message for you with some, some contacts and some other useful information. So we always have a general se uh, section on news and announcements a space for general discussion, um, uh, pre-posting when needed, and if you have concrete uh, questions for the experts, there's also a space for that. We wanted to make sure you have that, you can have that communication relationship uh, ensured. Then we go through the modules and we start by having and providing an overview of what we we'll learn through reading weeks. These are generally two, and we, we give you enough time to go back to Brigitte point to make sure that you Again, if you are working full time and if you have uh, burning schedules that you take your own time and, and have enough uh, can go with your pace, within your own pace through the readings and have already a general overview of the modules that will be facilitated afterwards. 
So for instance, if I click here, um, you will see that um, you have a folder with core readings and essential readings, so you can decide how to prioritize your, your study and work. Then we, we move on indeed to the post, uh, to the to the facilitated weeks. Hello, Nicolai, you are here already. So Nicolai will be for this, uh, in this case, facilitating this week. Again, we have an introduction. We have discussion forums, which my colleague Brigitte mentioned as tools of application. So giving the example of the, the students at the time working with the refugee camps and then bringing their experiences immediately to the forum the day afterwards. There are some discussion topics proposed, but they are never, never exhausted. You are more than welcome and should, as Bibi can confirm as well, to provide other ideas of discussion. So they are all similar in terms of structure. Um, and, and, and then the weeks might, just a quick point to say that the weekend, the weeks might differ. So this one has a discussion forum and the self-assessment uh, self quiz. But then for the other week, we'll have a webinar. And apart from the discussion forum, it depends on what we are trying to explore to go through the learning outcomes and fomenting the skills that we also want you to develop. So uh, you'll see that this module have then uh, other facilitated weeks. And then in each of the modules, we have a reflective dedicated area in which you can reflect on your own learning experience and get feedback from us and an area in which you can find all your summative assignments, which are uh, usually divided in an essay and group work, but we are still, as Brigitte was saying, thinking this about this all the time, how to make this different, how to adapt it even more to your own needs. And then of course, we always look forward to hear about your evaluation and your feedback to, to be able to move on with this, with this um, suggestions and adapt it better to your needs. Um, and in a nutshell, this is Moodle. Of course, you then enrolling the program will have as much induction uh, as you need, and we are here to support you. So let me now go back to the PowerPoint. Um, I can then, of course, respond any questions there is about Moodle. And we have this last slide on our journey so far. Um, which is basically an overview on the topics we cover on our modules and um, and the composition of our student mass and um, and some focus on networking, research partnerships, work-based learning, and moving forward. And uh, on 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 this concrete step, I would like to invite my colleagues uh, John Hans and Bridget to say some words about the, the potential ways in which we see this, this, this program and our partnership moving along. Um, I'll try to, because we're running slightly over time. For me, really is in partnership with Oxford Brooks and specifically um, with my colleague Brigitte, that we continue to fine tune this program that is based on concrete, valuable skill sets, tools, and learning outcomes that um, you know will add to your professional capital um, as and when you continue to work in this sphere. Because I think it, it's um, it, it's an area that is particularly challenging, but is also um, an area that is constantly evolving. Um, and it offers great opportunities. Thank you. I will add maybe a few words on the importance, your importance, on the importance of our students and of our alumni. I mean, we are slightly above the 60 students who are announced here, but what is very important is that all of them almost are based in the field or at least for part of the program, if not all the program. So we are not building on our own experience only, but a lot on your experience. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And when I say peer-to-peer -peer learning, I consider myself as a peer to the student and not as a 
as a professor because obviously I, I learned so much from all your experience. And uh, talking about network, the network of alumni is something that we are keeping developing because it's very important. And we are lucky to have quite a few of the alumni staying with us. Some are participating to the program we have a few who have started PhDs with us. Um, some are coming back with ideas and uh, and sometimes just just with a project whenever they have some idea of project. So the the building of the community that involves all of you is extremely important for us. And uh, and of course all your ideas are the most welcome in order to keep developing this project and this program. I mean, I, I say project more than program, it's maybe because I see it as much as a project than a program. Thank you both. Um, so, Alex? Yes. To you, maybe? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So this is a wrap up. We finally will have some time for questions. On my hand, I should have moved uh, things um, more speedily, but I, 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 I'm, I, I'm guilty for <laughs> interest in these topics. And I thought the discussion part was indeed uh, not only interesting as necessary to explore what we have to offer. So this said, it's now time to, to open the floor for questions. Um, some, at least we, we have a few minutes. So uh, John, and I don't know if you're following the box if there are already some pressing ones. Otherwise, if you if you can jump into the conversation and 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 use the raise your hand tool so we can identify you and hear your question. I'll interrupt now the sharing of the PowerPoint so it's easier for me to see the chat. Okay. Um, let me just briefly give you um, a summary. So we had mm -hmm. a range of questions. So one was, can you please um, I need you to relate this program specific to um, to communication because I work mm. in the area of communication and um, we hope we answered your question. Then we had some questions of some participants who were saying, um, uh, do I need this um, degree? Should I complete this study to help me to find um, a position within the United Nations? Then we had some questions. Can you tell us what's the name of the program and what is the subject content? Allow me just to, I, I hope we did answer the question about communication, um, mm -hmm. but it's just a question in terms of the, um, does this program help you to find mm -hmm. employment in the United Nations? Um, my answer that I would like to propose is any um, master degree that you will study is will give you part of an of, of a qualification that you can put forward to show that you have the academic qualification and that academic qualification to attest to knowledge and skills that you would have but the other 50% belongs to you and that is how you're going to write your letter um, and how you're going to put forward your specific skill sets and um, the institution knows exactly what they're looking for so I think it would be it, we will be ill-informed to say to you absolutely that this degree is going to open doors for you but what I do wish to invite you is to look at the United Nations um, job portal because there are positions throughout the United Nations that um, is announced literally on a weekly basis. And, and I do invite you to, um, if you feel that you are qualified and competent in um, some of those areas, do, um, do 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 apply through that portal but not only also work as you know the united nations is the united nations of the world nations also work through your respective governments to be able to um put your application forward because very often through the ministries of foreign affairs they also have a listing of all the un positions thank you 
So on the question about the, the, the title, I think of the program, it was already mentioned by my colleagues throughout the discussion, but indeed it's our master program is in humanitarian action and peace building. Um, and explores exactly what Brigitte said at the beginning, to not isolate one field or another, but to see them as, as together. I've seen another question, if I may. Yes, of course. About uh, the fact that uh, can, can I mean, can you come to this program if you do not have already uh, an experience in the field of humanitarian action and peace building, uh, but you are thinking of joining uh, the field? And, and yes, of course, we we are not. I mean, we we have every every year a few students with less experience and they are extremely valuable as well because they can bring should i say a bit more naive questions sometimes uh, but those questions sometimes uh, force us to rethink about what we are doing in a very very careful way so it's extremely useful we have also students who are coming from different fields and we're thinking of uh, of joining the field of humanitarian action and it's quite uh, relevant as well because uh, they bring another practice and through the practice they can also enrich a lot the field we are working on we had people for example coming from the commercial sector and willing to move to the non-commercial sector and their experience in the commercial sector was really valuable in order to understand the difference between how we run an NGO for example and a commercial sector we had journalists coming and journalists were really useful as well to try to understand crisis and to try to see how do we go from understanding to response and uh, so all of these may, makes again the share learning so so valuable so even if you I mean, if you hesitate, you can always come to us and ask if your background in, uh, um, background experience is relevant for the program. But usually we are quite open uh, to take people with very different profile because they really enrich the cohort much more than anything else. There is another question about PhD and actually I have already answered indirectly by saying that we have a couple of students who stay with us for PhDs. So yes, the master degree can open to a PhD potentially. Uh, of course, it depends on uh, the quality of the, of the research proposal that will come and if we have the uh, capacities to, uh, to supervise, but otherwise potentially yes. And there's another question I see on, uh, do we link what we are doing with sustainability? And I guess that yes, indeed, uh, the fact of, of linking peace building and humanitarian action is actually the fact that we are searching for form of sustainability. So yes, indeed, the, the issue of sustainability is addressed. There is not one module on sustainability, but this is really one of the overarching issue that we are really dealing with in each and every module. Thank you, Brigitte. I, 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 I have to inform you that due to the Zoom requirements, which are, you know, limited with everybody assessing Zoom uh, due to the COVID pandemic as well, in our organization, we have around five minutes to wrap up. Um, and I see there are some hands raised. So, so we have Ramesh and Francis. What I would ask would be for you to keep your, your question to the point as much as you can. And to the others, what I would suggest is that I, we would share our email contacts in the chat box, uh, my colleagues and I, and you can certainly come back for us for any question you might have, or alternatively, or, or, or as a plus, you can also, because this is being recorded, leave your email contacts in the chat box and we'll go through it and contact you afterwards, okay? So, uh, Ramesh, Maybe can I start? This is Francis. Sure, Francis, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to know what is the fee structure of the course? Hmm. Yeah, just that. Thank you, Francis. Car Caroline uh, or Brigitte, could you? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, Thank you, Caroline. It's 
paid over two years. So you pay in three instalments per year, generally September, January and April. So you don't need to pay it all at once. Does that help? Um, I, I just, uh, because I don't know what the amount that is involved for the entire course. Is it possible also to mention that? Uh, yeah. Rajit, can you remember exactly the amount this year? <laughs> no, it's slightly above £9,000, but uh, I don't know the exact figures, but it's around 9000 Am I right, Caroline? Maybe Something like 9000 isn't it? I can't remember the exact. And divide it in six instalments. Uh, for the moment, that, that's okay. Thanks so much. Over two years, and this is for, of course, for the entire program. Yeah. Thanks so much. That's helpful. Yeah. Ramesh. Yeah. Same question, which is already discussed. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, as I suggested for. If you if you like us to contact you directly, we kindly ask you to leave your 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 email contacts in the chat. We'll go through it over over the the, the recording, and I'll also invite my colleagues to share theirs in the chat box um, so students can contact us. Um, doing it now myself and. Um, before I wrap up, I would like to ask for the for our guests for any final remark, and then move on to, to my colleague Brigitte and John Hans, if they have their some re really two final words, and then I would say goodbye for today. Nikolai. Well, I think just thank you to everyone for attending, and thank you for a lively discussion. Thank you for joining us. Nikolai, Mimi. I think uh, Mimi. There's some issue with your connection. I think. Yes. Thank you very. Are you there? Yes, we Am are I here. here. Okay. Sorry, I lost you guys. Thank you very much for everyone's participation. And um, I can assure you, I'm a testimony. The program at Oxford Brooks and uh, UNITA is a very unique one, and there's so much you can learn from it. It's as would thank you, Bimi, for what you also taught us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Brigitte, two final words. I need to find and what to do also. <laughs> and we're looking forward to seeing you in, on the program in the coming months. That would be lovely to be able to keep on with our discussion and uh, our learning, mutual learning, um, in, a, in a few months' time. Donald? Thank you very much. Just on behalf of all of us, a big, sincere, massive thank you for um, spending your morning and your afternoon um, and to share with us. Thank you so much. And we look forward to continue this discussion with you. Thank you. On my end, I also want to thank you uh, for bearing with me with the sharing of this meeting. And it was lovely to meeting you all and to exchange this very, very interesting ideas. Thank you all. Uh, and I also want to give, since this will be recorded, a special thanks to our colleagues at the marketing departments, both of UNITAR and Oxford Brooks Away, Katerina and uh, Dominic. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Uh, thank you, good night. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.